Hey guys, Abraham here. I just want to remind you guys that we upload all of our courses to Skillshare. Skillshare is this amazing site where you can access a ton of different content to learn, improve and grow as an artist. We have all of our courses available to watch and learn from right now in Skillshare. You can check the description down here and Skillshare is offering one free month trial to their premium membership. With this membership, you're going to be able to access all of our courses and watch and learn all of the amazing things that we cover with all of the softwares. So what are you waiting for? Check Skillshare down here below. Hi guys, welcome to this special chapter. Today we're going to be taking a look at Unreal Engine 5. Not only are we going to be taking a look at Unreal and how it works and how we're going to be using it, we're also going to be designing, creating and implementing a very nice little system that's going to teach you all of the basics that you need to understand and know about Unreal Engine 5 and how it works. We're going to do a little bit of modeling inside of Maya. Feel free to do that inside of Blender if you don't know Maya. And uh, yes, we're going to be doing a little bit of texturing as well inside of Substance Painter just to make sure things look as nice as possible. And after that, we're going to jump straight into Unreal Engine Engine 5 and we're going to talk about blueprints, how they communicate with each other and how to properly create a system that will allow us to create something that's going to be very, very flexible for any game that we might want to create. So hang on tight and let's start. Hey guys, welcome to the first video in this special chapter. Today we're going to continue or start actually with Unreal Engine basics. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Unreal Engine is of course completely free uh, as long as you're learning. And eventually if you were to publish a game, unless you make certain amount of money, uh, it's also free. Once you pass a certain amount of money, you will need to pay uh, some royalties to Epic Games, of course. Now you're going to download the Epic Games launcher. You're going to go here to library and you're going to make sure to add an engine version over here. As you can see, I already have my my uh, 5.0 uh, version installed. That's the one that we're going to be using. And you're just going to hit launch. That, that's all you need to do. Just hit launch and wait for this thing to load. This is going to be the, like the landing page for the engine itself. Now, one thing that I do need to make uh, clear right now is Unreal Engine is quite heavy. It's kind of like if you were playing a game in real time. Uh, and uh, that is, of course, amazing for a lot of things, but it can also be a little bit like taxing on your computer. So make sure to work with the amount of uh, like detail or, or graphics that your computer will handle. I'm going to go here to games and we're going to create a third person game right here. This is going to be based on blueprints. This is the first like big question that we need to ask ourselves is how do we want to program when we jump into programming or scripting? How do we not want to do it? Do we want to do it traditionally with C++ or do we want to use the blueprint system, which is a visual scripting language? I'm personally, and this is a huge disclaimer, I am not a programmer. I do not program things. I'm an artist. So blueprints for me are amazing because even without knowing C++, I can create stuff and I can start like playing around with certain uh, variables and stuff that's going to make it a lot easier for me to just get an idea out of, uh, out of, out of, of the door. So Blueprint is the one that we're going to be using. Our target platform is going to be desktop. That's fine. Quality. Here's where you can change. You can change to maximum or scalable. If your computer is a little bit uh, on the low end, make sure to select scalable. In my case, I'm going to go with maximum. I do want to have started content turned on. And I, right now, as the time of this recording, I do not have an RTX card. So I won't be able to be using ray tracing. Uh, but yeah, that's it. So I'm definitely going to go to our project here. So let's go to NT Mini Premium. There we go. Let's go, uh, let's create a new folder here. I'm going to call this NT Mini Premium UE, which is going to be Unreal. So every time we work on an Unreal project, it's going to go right there. You can save this wherever you want. Uh, just make sure you have enough space because this folder can get quite big as we add more and more stuff. And uh, we're going to name it. So we're just going to name this uh, NT, uh, let's go for something like... Uh, Imaginarium, because we're going to be imagining Imaginarium, a lot of things. So let's go. Now, um, again, as I've mentioned, it will take a little bit of space. I believe when you first create a project, it's about two gigabytes because it needs to create a lot of different assets. It copies those assets into the project itself, like all of the starter content, the characters, textures. Uh, there's a lot of things that come with, uh, with like the pre-packaged stuff. So just make sure you have enough space. And uh, yeah, I mean, once we have this, as you can see, we are going to be inside of the of the interface. Now, the interface is rather easy to navigate. I'm going to close that. By default, that thing is, is turned off. Um, so right here is the viewport. This is, of course, our window to the world. You might hear a little bit of a noise on the background. It's raining right now. <laughs> so uh, that's the rain hitting the, the ceiling. And um, yeah, this is the, the way we, we uh, navigate. Now, you can navigate similar to how you do in Maya with Alt and right click. Let me 
Turn on. A lot of people have been asking. Karnak is the little software that we use to capture the keystrokes. So Alt and click, it's going to rotate the camera. Alt and middle click, it's going to pan the camera. And Alt and right click is going to zoom the camera. So if you're used to Maya, it works pretty much exactly the same. The only thing is I actually like to use WASD as in the game. So if you press right click and then you press uh, WASD, you're going to be like uh, navigating, kind of like if it was like a like a little plane inside of, uh, inside of Unreal. So whenever I'm working inside of Unreal, I like to use my WASD to move around. So again, this is the main like viewport. This is where we're gonna we're gonna be seeing and implementing all of the things that we're gonna be building. And um, over here we have of course the outliner. The outliner is all of the information that we have here uh, of of what objects live inside of the world. If you think about this, it's pretty much the same thing as in uh, Maya. It's the outliner. It's just like a description of all the static meshes, blueprints, lights, maps, cameras, whatever you have in your scene is gonna appear right here. Whenever you select something inside of the scene, of course, the detail properties will show up and it will tell you all of the different things you need to know about the object, such as the location, rotation, scale, etc., etc. Um, let's update that real quick. There we go. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for the for the, like the general purpose here. Now down here is this thing called the content drawer. It used to be the content browser, but they kind of like streamline it so that you can just like click it in and out whenever you don't need it, so that you have more real estate on the on the screen for your world. I, I personally like having my content browser like a uh, dock, so I click this button called dock in layout. Yes, my game screen becomes a little bit smaller, but uh, that way I don't have to open and close this thing every now and then. I believe there was a shortcut, control spacebar is a shortcut. So if we get rid of this and we press control spacebar, we can open and close this little uh, thing, which again, it's all based on uh, preferences. Uh, here, as you can see, we have the characters folder, we have the level prototyping folder, we have the starter content, and we have the third person uh, content. So if we go to the starter content, for instance, and we go into the props section, you can see that we have props here. And these are just like basic random objects that the Unreal Engine has, so that you play around with like how to position and move things around. It, it really doesn't make any, like it doesn't have any difference uh, than other like traditional 3D softwares. If you move an object to the world and you press W, you're gonna go into movement. If you press E, you're gonna go into rotation. If you press R, you're going to go into scale and all of the gizmos work exactly as you might expect, like nothing like different here. There's one button that I do like, uh, which I recommend you memorize. Whenever you place an object and you want to make sure that this thing is flat to the ground, if you press your end button, which is usually on the top of your arrow keys, end, it's going to just go, it's going to move the pivot point to where uh, like touches the first like plane. And this respects other objects. So if I were to be here and I press end, it will stop right there. So very, very handy little shortcut, just end page to uh, bring this thing to the, like to the, to the collision that you normally have, as you can see right there. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, you can just rotate, move, scale. I know this is very basic. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page if you've never used Unreal before. I'm going to delete that one real quick. And um, a couple of things that you might want to check out, uh, especially like up here on the show options, you have a lot of the things that you can turn on and off. Here we have the modes. So lit, unlit, wireframe, for instance. You have, of course, alt, four, three, two, five, six, uh, which are the shortcuts for those modes. Here are the cameras, perspective, top, bottom, left, right, front, back. You like I normally just work everything on perspective, but every now and then these are quite useful. And then over here, um, we have things such as the FPS. Important to know how many FPSs we're running at to know if our game is slow or not. Uh, we have stats, other things. And there are a couple of advanced settings here. Not here, though. Let me see, because they, they moved them from Unreal Engine 4. Trying to find where the, like the, what's the word is? Like how much uh, resolution and stuff we're using. I, I can't seem to find right now. Well, anyway, so yeah, this is the, the main like view. And finally, if you just hit this play button right here, everything is set up so that this is a third person character uh, world. So as you can see, we already have this character. Uh, her name is Quinn. And uh, Quinn here, uh, she's like this sort of like humanoid robot. Uh, everything is pretty much like a latex suit. Everything is just like a single mesh. I'll show you it uh, once we get into into Maya. And um, yeah, she has a jump, movement, and everything already programmed in so that we don't have to mess with anything. So eventually when we do our little prop right here, our nice little like scenario interaction, we're going to be using Quint here to make sure that everything works as intended.
other than that you just need to make sure that uh, you always save so you can click, uh, click right here save or uh, right here save all to make sure that wh whatever we import textures models animations whatever everything is saved in your project so the first project that we created when we created the, the whole thing that's where every single piece of uh, information is going to be saved do not forget to save because you don't want to lose any of your information and um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it, guys. This is pretty much for the for the basics of the of the interface right here. In the next video, we're gonna talk about scales, and I'm gonna show you how to bring the mannequin uh, or Quinn right here into Maya, so that anything that we model matches her very very closely. Okay, so hang on tight, and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye bye. Hi guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to continue with real world scale. And this is one of the most important things that you need to take into consideration whenever you're working for a game project. Usually game engines such as Unreal and Unity will work with a specific type of unit that you need to make sure you have properly set up in either Maya, Blender, 3D Studio Max, whatever software you decide to use. In our case, since we're using Maya, we need to understand well what the proper uh, like element would be there. So I'm going to go here and I'm actually going to insert a basic uh, shape and it's going to be a cube. So if I insert this cube right here, you're going to notice that this cube has a scale of 1, 1, and 1. So it's it's one unit across. The big question is, how big is this cube? Well, if we were to hit play, you would see that this cube roughly measures, or not roughly, measures 1 meter. Okay, So a 1 by 1 by 1 cube will be a 1 meter cube. However, that's not the same case inside of a Maya. I'll show you how to bring a coin in just a second. Uh, so inside of Maya, when we start working, the grid is really, really small. And if we create a little cube, this is also a one by one by one cube. However, the difference is that this cube is only one centimeter in units. So if we were to export this object into Unreal, it would know that this was made inside of Maya and it would uh, change the measurements so that it's a very, very small cube, okay? Now, what you want to do is you just want to remember that, of course, but we will also need, or one thing that I suggest is changing the size of the grid so that the, so the one square on the grid matches to one unit inside of Unreal. And the way to do this is actually very simple. You're going to go into display, grid, little option box here, and you're going to change the units to a thousand, a hundred, and one. If you hit apply. So now each square that you see on the grid is a one meter square. So that's a one square meter. And of course, if we were to create a cube like that one and change the proportions to a hundred, that would be a one meter uh, cube. Okay. Again, this is very, very important. There's always this debate of whether or not you should model everything in real world scale from the get go. And um, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if you remember to scale everything at the very end. However, what I tell my students is try to always model things in real scale so that you don't have to like remember to scale everything back up when you're done. Because a lot of uh, the times you forget about it, you export a thing, someone gets the asset inside of Unreal and they realize that the asset is like completely, completely off scale. And then it's a back and forth, making sure that everything measures properly. And it's just a, it's just a waste of time and uh, not the best uh, way to, to make things. So try to always, always, always model things in real world scale. Now, there's two ways in which you can make sure that you're modeling something in real world scale. And the first one would be to, of course, create a sort of a mannequin in here that tells you the rough uh, volume of a character inside of Unreal. What I usually like to do if I don't have a lot of time is I just create a cube and I set the scale in Y to 180. I change the scale to 100 and the scale on Y to 100. So that's roughly the volume that the character would occupy. Now, to make sure this is set up to the grid, you can press D, and then with V, snap it to the lowest point, and then with X, just snap it to the grid right there. There we go. So I know that if I were to create, I don't know, like let's say a chair, right? Well, if I want to create a chair, I know that since that's the that's the character right there, the chair would be like about this size, right? And I can just start like modeling and uh, the sculpting or doing whatever I need to make sure that the, that the scale of the chair is proper. Now, again, as I've mentioned, if you forget about this, don't worry. You can scale everything up once you're about to send this into Unreal. However, a good rule of thumb is try to always work in real world scale. Now, if you don't want to work with the volume and you actually have a character such as uh, ourselves over here with uh, Quinn, um, one thing that we would be or would be very beneficial for us would be to have the actual geometry of the character so that we can compare every single thing that we're creating to the model that's eventually going to be interacting with the object, right? Well, the cool thing about Unreal is that all of the things that you see here, at the end of the day, they're just libraries, right? They're, they're just files that are saved and optimized for Unreal, but they still hold all of the information that you might need for any DCC application. So I'm going to go here to the 
third person aspect, or sorry, to the character uh, place, and then to mannequins, and then to meshes, and you're gonna see that we have Manny and we have Quinn. Manny is the male character, um, the male character static mesh that we use. Well, these are skeletal meshes. Skeletal meshes differ from a traditional static mesh because the skeletal meshes have joints and have a skin information. So this is our like male character. And of course, here is our female character, okay? Now, as I mentioned, these guys actually have bone information inside of them. So we can go uh, here to the skeleton and you can see all of the different bones that have the character and the way they're bind to the skin. Someone was asking me in, the, um, in one of our uh, courses whether or not this sort of stuff can be done inside of Unreal. And I've been doing some research, and as far as I can tell, all of these things, like the, the positioning of the joints and the skinning, you still need to do that in a DCC application. Unreal doesn't have that yet, but what Unreal just added is a control setup that you can use to animate and, uh, and create controllers, like create a control rig here inside of Unreal. But you still need to wait and, uh, and rig your character in another application. So as you can see, this character is perfectly, perfectly rigged. It's working very nicely. So the only thing you need to do is right click and then go here into app, um, asset actions and export. Okay? Okay. This will export the object as an FBX. And now if you go into Maya and you say file, import, make sure to have the FBX uh, plugin enabled. And if you import the uh, queen element here, which is right here, skeletal mesh queen, as you can see, they use the SKM uh, uh, like uh, naming convention for, for skeletal meshes. Uh, we'll get everything, the deformers, the skin clusters, the bones, everything is going to be here. And uh, technically, we could actually like animate this here inside of Maya. Uh, the only problem is that we will need to, to move the bones themselves. Like there, There's no control rig. And of course, that's a little bit uh, complicated. But if you want to like move things and, and do things around the character, then there you go. Now, if this becomes a little bit heavy for you, scene, one quick little trick that I can show you here. Duplicate the geometry. You're going to have like a duplicated geometry right about here. Uh, it should be this one. And I'm gonna shift P to get it out of the of the system. There we go. And then I'm gonna right click this and I'm just gonna say break connections. Or sorry, unlock connections. There we go. Now we definitely need to rotate this so that it's facing forward. And then we can delete the original mesh. So that way we only have a mesh and we don't have any skeleton. That's gonna make our scene a little bit lighter because at the end of the day, the only thing we need is this one, right? This is the, the scale proportion that we want and we wanna make sure that everything matches with this character right here. So now if we were to create anything, anything, like let's say we're gonna do like a, some sort of lever, right, on the ground. Well, I know that if I'm gonna do a lever, this is probably gonna be the size that I want for the lever, right? The size of the lever itself I don't have to second guess or anything because since I have the information there with the character, I know how, how big or how small I need this things to be so that it matches the way she's going to be like moving things or interacting with things, right? So yeah, that, that's pretty much it, guys. That's the that's the like main thing that you need to make sure that you have properly set up whenever you're starting any sort of project for games. Make sure that the real world scale is set up uh, in, the, in the right way. And with this, we're ready to jump onto the creation of our assets. I'm going to talk about what we're going to be doing in the next video. I'm actually going to be showing you uh, a game where we, are, we have that exact interaction and we're going to replicate that interaction inside of our own game. So hang on tight. And I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to continue with the Blueprint Basics. We're going to talk about the basic functionality of a Blueprint, and we're actually going to be doing our first scripting section. Now, um, I am going to be throwing you guys into the fire. Uh, normally, whenever I teach Blueprints, I go like, like super, super simple stuff, and then we go into more advanced stuff. So I'm going to like go straight to the main point right here. I'm going to go here into Unreal, and in the Content folder, I'm going to create a new folder, and we're going to call this Blueprints, okay? And here inside of the blueprints folder, I'm gonna create a new. I'm gonna create a, a, a blueprint, which is this thing right here. So um, the way I want you to think about blueprint classes is these are like the like the gears and the pieces that move everything inside of Unreal. And there's so many different types of blueprints you can have: character blueprints, actor blueprints, palm blueprints, player controller, and even like more AI blueprints, uh, sound blueprints. Like there's, there's so many things that have to do with blueprints that we're gonna be using. Of course, we're not gonna see everything, um, but everything can be boiled down to the actor blueprint the actor blueprint is like the the most like the, the easiest a blueprint to understand what is an actor think about an actor as in, in a movie an actor is anything that's going to be inside of the game that you're going to be able to be or that you're going to be placing or spawning in the world that's the proper definition so i'm going to create a new blueprint here this blueprint is going to be called a lever okay 
And inside of a blueprint, when you hit enter here in the blueprint, you're going to go into the blueprint editor, which, which is where we're going to be like constructing our blueprint. And the blueprint is made out of several things. One of them is called components. Okay. So what are components? Anything you can think of. If you are thinking about the mesh, that's a static mesh component. If you're thinking about a, an animated character, that's a skeletal mesh component. If you're thinking about light, of course, that's point light. You can have shapes, you can have audio, you can have particles, you can have uh, a lot of different things. As you can see, there's all of this different components that we can add into our blueprint and they will of course give us more functionality that we can play around with i'm going to show you a super super basic blueprint right now if you want you can replicate this and then we're going to jump onto the lever blueprint so i'm going to add a point light into my scene or into my blueprint scene and i'm going to move this point light 150 units up so it's a meter and 50 centimeters up into the into the ground and i'm going to change the color to something like a green light i'm just going to hit okay right now since we don't have any geometry here with the with the light uh, we're not going to see anything but this blueprint exists now and i can hit compile and that's it now if i were to go over here to my level editor and i grab this blueprint which right now it's called lever and i just drag and drop it as you can see we have a green uh, a green point light and of course if we play this uh, the green point light is actually well emitting light into the scene and, and that's what we have now you might think about this and say well how can we add like functionality H how does the scripting work inside of blueprints so what are the things that we're going to be taking a look at right well that's very easy on the event graph, we're going to be constructing our visual guide to how this blueprint will operate. Right now, this is just a single point light, and it's no more different than just going here and adding like a light and adding this thing called a point light. Just bring this here. There we go. And then in the properties, we can just select the green color. And it's it's the same thing. Right now, they're working exactly the same. Performance-wise, it's pretty much the same thing. So uh, just two different light scenarios. Perfect. Now... If we want to add functionality to the light, we can start playing around with different nodes that are going to change the way that the light is going to be well, behaving when the game is playing. These nodes right here are called, are called event nodes, and they will trigger whatever function, whatever action we want them to trigger when they uh, will get triggered, right? So for instance, this one right here, I'm actually going to delete this one for now. This one right here, it's one of the most common ones. It's called event begin play. And what the event begin play does is when the game begins, it will just trigger this event and whatever is connected to this flow will get executed. So let's try something super simple such as toggle visibility, okay? So I'm going to drag and drop my point light here. This is going to reference the object. This is like a, it's like creating a variable that's called point light and it's pointing to this specific point light. It's called a reference. And from this reference, we can drag and drop this pin and just uh, write in toggle visibility. So what this will do is when the game begins, the visibility of the line with, will be toggled. So right now, since the light is turned on, as you can see right here, the rendering is visible set to on. When we start the game, if I were to start the game right now and I hit play, that light is going to be off. Why? Because when the game starts, the light goes off. Now, if I go back here and I go into the event graph and I add a node, I'm pressing tap, by the way, to add nodes and I just write delay. I can add a delay node that's going to slow down the execution of these variables. And I can say, <coughs> sorry, I can say wait five seconds until you toggle the visibility of this element. I'm going to hit compile again. Now, if I hit play, the light is on. And after five seconds, the light will go off like so. That's it. So congratulations. If you're following along, then you just created your first blueprint or like dynamic blueprint that changes depending on how we change this elements right here. Now I'm going to talk about the concept that's called variables. A variable is any sort of uh, information because it can be numbers, it can be text, it can be a lot of different things, but it's, it's an information that can be changed. Hence the name variable, right? Right now, as you can see, the duration on this delay node is set to five seconds. Five, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just five seconds. That's the unit, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click this and I'm going to promote this to a variable. And what's going to happen is now we're going to get this nice little node right here that says duration. Over here, we're also going to have our duration and we're going to have this float. I'm going to compile real quick. And as you can see, by default, it still has those five seconds that we had before. Now, the cool thing about this one is that I can select this and change it. And I can say, you know what? I want this to be off at three seconds. If I hit compile and then I play this and I move all around and I take a look at the light, after three, th three seconds, the light goes off as well. So why is this powerful? Why, why are variables so important? Because we can actually change the variables for each individual instance of the blueprint that we might have. And that, my friends, is one of the magic things about blueprints. Once you create a blueprint, such as this nice little um, 
light bulb right here once you create the blueprint you can replicate this blueprint as many times as you want like this okay so now if i were to start the game all of these lights are gonna go off in three seconds like that because they're copying the exact same code so instead of having to copy the code four times i just literally duplicate the blueprint and we're gonna get four instances of that blueprint and our game is gonna be working exactly as i intend so the cool thing about this, this is like the a little bit more advanced stuff, is that we can actually do something called exposing a variable. To expose this variable, the only thing we need to do is click this little element right here, this little eye icon right now, it's like a closed eye. If I click it, it's like an open eye. And if I hit compile, what's gonna happen now is if I select any of these blueprints over here, on the property section, on the details, we're now gonna have a variable right here that says duration. So for instance, I can say, you know what? I want this one to go off at five seconds. I want this one to turn off at four seconds. This one's gonna turn off at three seconds and this one's gonna be two seconds. So now each individual variable, even though they are the same like blueprint, each individual blueprint right here instance will behave slightly different. So we have two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and five seconds. And as you can see, by combining these very basic principles, we're gonna be able to build and create a lot of different things that are gonna make it a lot easier for us to create something that's gonna look amazing. Now, one of the fun things that I like about Unreal is that you don't have to have like the final model piece when you're playing around with blueprints. You can do very basic blueprint creation and make sure things work way, way, way before doing the full modeling or the full uh, texturing process for your elements. So that's what we're about to do. I'm going to go here to my character and I want to create a lever. Um, I, I, I haven't talked about what we're going to be doing. Um, I'm going to show you in, in the next video. I'm gonna, actually going to open the game. We're going to see a little bit of Elden Ring and I'm going to show you a nice uh, lift that they created and, I'm, and we're going to be replicating that lift. Um, now the lift has a lever. So I'm going to create a, a cylinder here that's going to be the, the base for my lever. So something like this. The lever, of course, has a little bit of a base. So let's create like a nice little blocky element right here, which is gonna work as our base for the lever. And as you might imagine, we're gonna have our lever uh, pushing through, the, through this thing right here. Now, here's where the important things are gonna start happening. One of the things that Unreal really, really needs or wants is for everything to be positioned in a nice way here inside of Maya or your favorite DCC application. Uh, what does this mean? Well, Unreal doesn't care about the pivot points of your objects inside of Maya. When you export the object, the pivot point is automatically going to go to the origin. So if I press, uh, if I go to the right view right now and I check where the cylinder is, the pivot point of the cylinder, even though my cylinder is floating, the pivot point of the cylinder is going to go all the way down here. If we want to be super exact about this, what we can do is we can just like snap this thing down there. And there we go. So now we have this lever right here. Now, I know I mentioned we were not going to do a lot of modeling and we're not. I'm just going to do a very quick extrusion right here. So we get like a nice little handle right there. Perfect. So um, I know that in Unreal, when I export this to Unreal, this is static mesh, what's going to happen to the pivot point is that the pivot point is going to be snapped to the center right here. So if I move this thing, this is what I would expect to see. So it's probably going to go from here to about there. So it's going to rotate a couple of degrees. And uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So I'm going to select the three pieces. Let's rename them. That's going to be really important. Well, let's first, the history, center pivot, phase transformation it really doesn't matter because again, all of these things are going to be uh, zeroed out in the pivot point inside of Unreal. So this one's going to be lever mechanism. This is going to be lever base. And this is going to be lever handle. I'm gonna grab all of these three objects, gonna say file, export selection. Uh, I'm gonna export them into our assets folder. I'm gonna create a new folder. Let's call this UI5 assets. You said we know that things are gonna be there and let's call this lever. As you can see, we're exporting this in FBX. Um, technically, um, if we go all the way down here, you can see that on the advanced options, the FBX file format we're using 2020, even though this is Maya 2023. I do recommend sticking to 2020. That's probably like the most uh, uh, stable one. So we're gonna hit export selection and now we're gonna go into Unreal and right here, I'm gonna right click, import. We're gonna navigate to our objects, of course. Let's go here. Uh, I believe it's here, here. 
here and there we go. Now, when you export an FBX, the first thing it's going to ask you is whether you want this to use Nanite. In this case, since it's a very simple object, we really don't need Nanite. And uh, what I'm going to do is here in the advanced options, I actually want to make sure that combined meshes is set to off because we want to have each separate piece of the lever, uh, well, as a single unit. So I'm going to hit import. And what's going to happen, as you can see, is we now have these three pieces, three static meshes. You can see that this is a static mesh due to a little uh, light, light blue color. And if you hover your mouse on the top, you're going to see the name, which in this case is called lever underscore lever base, because it's grabbing the name of the object and the name of the file. Uh, so it's like a double name right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here into my uh, my lever, lever uh, blueprint. I'm actually going to erase the point light. I don't need it anymore. Let's delete this once as well. And I'm just going to go into my viewport and I'm going to drag and drop this guys right here. And as you can see, everything is zeroed out. If I grab this guy right here, the pivot point is down there. So we're going to be animating this thing, moving from one side to the other. Of course, not in this video, but in the next one. And uh, yeah, our, our blueprint is ready. The only thing that I need for this blueprint to work a little bit better is interaction, right? Right now we don't have the animation, but I would like to start building up a little bit of the functionality for this blueprint. So how are we going to do that? Well, I know that when my character is close to this lever, I want to activate the option for the character to be able to well, press the lever or use the lever. So I'm going to add something called a box collision. Super, super common things to use inside of games. I'm going to move this box collision up and I'm going to change the extent to something like 100, 100 and 100. So that's like the whole area. I think it's a little bit too much on the X. So let's go for like 50. Or maybe a little bit less, like 40, 20. There we go. Uh, a little bit more. Probably like, I think 50 is fine. So that we're, if we're like close to the object, we get the interaction. Maybe even a little bit more. So let's go 60. And maybe here we don't need to go so high. So something like this should be more than enough. There we go. So it's 60, 150. That's our, our value there. And this box, I'm going to press F2 to rename this. We're going to call this lever collision. So when the character collides with this object, we want to make sure that we're able to use the element. Okay. Now, um, I'm just going to do something here real quick. I'm going to right click the level collision. I'm going to add an event and I'm going to add something called on component begin overlap. It's a very, very common event. And what it does is basically when something collides with this object, something's going to happen. Like the trigger is going to be uh, executed and whatever again follows this execution pin will happen. So in this case, I just want to add a very basic print. I'm just going to do print string and the string is you have interacted with the lever. I'm going to hit compile and there we go. So now if we go here, you can see that every single uh, light that we had has now been replaced by the lever. And if we hit play, when the character gets close to those levers, what's going to happen is on the top uh, left corner, you're going to see a little message that says you have interacted with the lever. So this tells me that my blueprint is working properly. I have the geometry where I want it to be. The character is interacting with this. So, so it recognizes that the character is near the lever. Now, the next part is going to be, of course, to make sure that the lever works. So, yeah, that's it for this one, guys. Make sure to get to this point and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to continue with the blueprint. And if you guys remember, this is what we had. I actually had to <laughs> restart because I got a little bit of a crash here. Uh, but this is our basic blueprint and uh, we just very quickly added the collision box, right? Now I want to start working on the actual interaction for this element. So I'm just going to scale this thing up a little bit so we can interact with it. And we're going to start building what's going to be the animation of the lever. Because right now we only had this, or on the other one, we only had this sort of like indication that we were actually interacting with the element. But I want to make sure that, um, that we can move the lever from one position to another. So if we go to the lever handler right here, the first thing is I'm actually going to set this guy to the rotation that I want. Let's go to 70 right here because I really want like a long rotation from here all the way to the other side. So we're going to start with 70 and we're going to go all the way to minus 70. So that already tells us one of the first things that we need to know. We are going to have a start point and an end point for our rotation or a start rotation and an end rotation. And that's something that we want to control with variables because it's going to give us more flexibility and it's going to make sure that everything works as intended. So the way this works is I'm going to create a variable right here. I'm going to change the type of variable to a rotator and I'm going to call this initial rotation. I'm going to compile and the initial rotation is going to be 70 on the X axis like that and compile again. I can right click and duplicate this variable. And this is going to be called whoop, right here. This is going to be called end 
rotation, like that. And uh, this end rotation is going to be set to, we're going to compile again, and this is going to be minus 70. So we're going to again go from our viewport from 70 all the way to minus 70. So that's what we want. If I just leave it like this and continue plugging in all of the other things that we need to plug in, it's going to be more like a switch. It's just going to go from one to the other, and that's not what we want. We want to have a nice smooth transition from one point to the other. How are we going to achieve that? Well, we're going to use two nodes. I'm going to uh, right click here. I'm going to call for the first one, which is called a timeline. I'll explain how this works in just a second. I'm going to call this lever animation. And I'm going to create another one called a lerp rotator. And the lerp rotator, as you can see here, it's a function. It's a little bit of a math element that we're going to have, which is going to move the element from point A to point B following a rotator variable, which we already have right here. Now, if you remember, variables can be just dragged in here, and there's two things we can do with variables. We can get them, which is just obtaining the information, or set them, which is changing that information. We're going to get the initial rotation, and we're just going to plug it into the A button. We're going to bring the um, end rotation, and we're going to plug this in into the B button right here. Now, all of this information, the transition from A to B, is going to be plugged in into something, right? Into the transform or into the rotation of the handle. So we need a reference to the handle, and we need to tell the, the handle, hey, I want to set your rotation. And as you can see, we had several options right here, and the one that we're going to be going for is this one called set relative rotation. And this value is going to go right here. Now, how are we going to connect this execution pin? Well, here's where the little lever animation comes into play. And this is pretty much like creating a, a graph uh, editor or a graph line or a timeline inside of, uh, inside of Maya or Blender. I'm just going to double click this guy and I'm going to create a new track, which is going to be my time. It's going to be float. And I'm going to change the length to something like two seconds. So everything's going to happen in two seconds. What's going to happen? Well, I'm going to right click, add a key, right click, add another key. The first key is going to be time zero, and the value is going to be zero, so it's going to be in point A. And this one is going to be a time one with a value, sorry, a time two with a value of one. Okay, I'm going to hit these two buttons to see this thing right here, and I'm going to hit compile. I can actually rename this track right now. It's called new track uh, zero. I'm going to rename this to uh, lever speed. Why? Because this, at the end of the day, is the math that's going to be driving the animation. And it's actually very simple. As you can see here, we're going from value 0 to value 1 in 2 seconds in a linear fashion. So as time moves forward, the value is going to be changing to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And all of that thing is now going to be living in this nice little uh, variable here called the lever speed, which we, are, of course, are going to plug into the alpha channel of the lever rotator. The alpha channel is pretty much the speed or, or the way that we're going to be blending between these guys. If the alpha is set to zero, we're going to have this full element right here. And if the alpha is set to one, we're going to have this full element right here. So we're blending between these two elements in a very nice way. Finally, we're going to bring this update into the set relative transform. And that's it. Our animation like module, our animation blueprint is ready for the handle to move from minus 70 all the way to 70. However, we need one final thing, and that, of course, is the trigger. We need to make sure that this thing starts. We want this thing to, to actually play, right? Because right now, nothing is being plugged into the lever animation. Now, before we compile this or before we, we connect this to the character, I just want to make sure that it works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press uh, tab here, right click again. I'm going to say begin, event begin play, and I'm just going to give it like a nice delay. Let's give it like a two second delay just so that we get enough time to... Uh, approach it and, and, and see it and connect this right here on the play button. We hit compile, no errors, so everything should be working pretty nicely. We bring the lever right there and let's bring a couple more just to see that all of them work. And we're just going to hit play. And if we wait two seconds, as you can see, boop, the lever goes from minus 70 to 70 and the animation is working perfectly, perfectly fine. Okay, I'm happy with that one, but now we need to start thinking about how are we going to make sure that this doesn't happen automatically and that the character is the one that actually animates or, or moves the lever. Well, first, we would need to create a custom event, which is going to be the event that the character is going to be calling or executing when we approach the element. So I'm going to press here, uh, tab again, and I'm going to write custom event, custom event, and I'm going to rename this lever activation. You can leave spaces or underscores, it's up to you. It's going to be the custom event lever activation. So when the lever activation event is triggered, all of this animation that we already saw works is going to be activated. 
Now the question is, how are we going to activate this? Well, we already had the collision right here, so I'm going to add an event on component begin overlap. And if you remember, we've already added the cast to third person character, which is the one that the thing that makes sure I'm not sure actually I, I think I didn't mention but this note right here very important note is like a phone call that we're going to be doing to the character because we don't want every single thing in the game to be able to set the the lever on we only want the character to be able to interact with it. So by using this cast to third person character, we're making sure that when we overlap this it checks it, it verifies that we're only interacting with the third person character if an enemy touches it if fire touches it if Whatever other thing touches it, nothing's going to happen. But if the character touches that touches it, then we're going to have something uh, occur. So in this case, we're going to say other actor. And the only thing I want this to do is whenever I overlap with the little lever right here, I just want to activate the lever. So in this case, I'm just going to call the function lever activation. We can add a delay if you want. But right now, I just want to keep it like this. And then we're going to be adding more... Um, flexibility to the blueprint so now if i hit play and i approach this guys the moment i approach them the lever is going to be turned on like this and there we go it's going to activate and it's going to be moving from one side to the other so the animation is working working perfectly fine which is uh it's great it's, it's looking good however we all we've all played games right and we know that usually things don't act activate by default some of them do but in this case i actually want to have a, a button that tells me to press a certain key or something to make sure that we're activating this when we want and um first of all i'm going to go here to the viewport options and I'm going to add a little bit of a message. So I'm going to add a text, text render. There we go. And we're going to move the text up. So let's move this up. Let's call this tooltip. And we're going to change the text on the tooltip, which is, uh, where is it? Right here, text. It's going to say press E. There we go. And uh, just hit compile, and that's it. So now, when we approach this thing from like either side, I think this is usually the side that we're going to see these things on, we're going to get this message saying press E. Now, what do I want to do? Well, I want to make sure that only we are only seeing that message when we are actually overlapping the box. So one, one thing we can do is we can bring the tooltip here. Remember the toggle visibility that we have? I'm going to say toggle visibility, and when the character overlaps the element, I want the toggle visibility to turn on, which means by default, this thing should be turned off. And when the this thing is, uh, we, when we end the overlap, which is another node that we can add right here, I want to, again, cast, cast to third person character. Make sure that that's the object that we're overlapping. And we're going to do another toggle visibility to uh, turn the tooltip off. So now we hit compile. I'm actually going to get rid of the activation for now. Just going to hit compile again. Just to make sure that the tooltip works first. So yeah, we approach, we get the press E, and when we get out, uh, the press E disappears. So it's just a nice little tooltip for my players, which usually happens on a UI or something, but we're keeping it very graphic here so that everyone can follow. Now that we have this tooltip, now it's time to add the uh, enable input and disable input so that our character can actually like input a key or some sort of direction or button so that we can move the lever when we want to. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but one that I really like to do is as a BP third person character, I'm just going to drag from here and I'm going to set something called enable input like this. Okay, so when we are within the bounds of the box, we are going to have our inputs enabled. And this is going to allow us to, well, just press any, any key. And what we can do here is we can create a keyboard event. If we type keyboard and we can look for that E key, like this one right here, and w when this enable input is well, enabled, the E key can actually do something, which in this case can be the lever activation. So I'm just gonna move this thing and say lever activation. And since the input is turned on, when we compile, um, we're gonna be able to do so. Now, one thing is here in the player controller, we, didn't, we do need to set this to get player controller. It's just calling the variable of the player so that what, what the player we're moving actually works. And uh, yeah, it's now time to try it out. So let's hit play right here. And when we move here, I can press E and uh, nothing is happening. Why is nothing happening? Probably because the E key is not being pressed. Here's where we can do something called debugging. Well, it's not actual debugging, but it's a way to understand why things are not working. So for instance, I'm gonna do a print right here. 
and I'm gonna try and see if this is actually printing. So I'm gonna say press, pressing E, and hit compile. So now if I hit play and I approach any of this and I press E, and I don't see the text, that means that this guy right here, this E press right here, is not actually being executed. Okay, so we're we're not we're not actually launching this key which means that even though we are enabling input, it's not reading that this is the input that we want to well, enable, right? So we're not gonna be activating this thing here. We are gonna be enabling the input when the character is, is on this uh, area, but it's not this area that's gonna be like launching the whole thing. We actually need to go all the way to the third person character over here and in the blueprints, we can enable the blueprint. This is the blueprint for the character. And as you can see, there's a lot of things in here. Um, we have the jumps, we have the movements and stuff. And um, as you can see, this is the movement input, uh, jump, stop jumping, uh, all of these elements. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a function here with the E keyboard again. So I'm just gonna write E keyboard. And we should get all of the keyboard events. Let's just look for the E, there we go. And what I want this is, well, when I press E, I wanna say, first of all, I wanna make sure that we are getting some, some feedback, right? So I'm gonna do a print string. I'm just gonna say pressing E. I'm gonna hit compile. So as you can see, if I hit uh, play now and I press E, I'm getting the press E command, which is great. But if I go here, even though I am pressing E, it's not actually communicating to this guy that we are pressing the E button. So we need to do a little bit of magic here. We're not gonna need to do the enable input anymore, which is great because as you saw, all of the inputs are already enabled for my character. This is, uh, by the way, a change that they did for Unreal Engine 5. Before this, uh, you actually had to enable the inputs. So we don't need to enable the inputs because the inputs are already enabled. Again, if we compile and then we take a look here, you can see that we can press the letter E and it shows that we are pressing the letter E. So the main thing is, okay, how do we communicate to the lever that we are pressing the letter E so that we can activate this letter right here. It's a little bit tricky, right? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, there's like the easy ways and the difficult ways. I am gonna be showing you one thing that's gonna be the, um, what's the word? It's it's it's, it's called, uh, well, it, I'm gonna do it with something called a, actually no, now that I think of it, that, that's not gonna work. So we're gonna have to do this a little bit more manually. This is not like the super, super optimal way. As I mentioned before, I'm not like a uh, hands-on programmer, but I'm just gonna show you a basic way in which we can achieve this. And the way we can achieve this is we can actually save a variable of the lever for our character so that it knows which lever it is actually like trying to modify, okay? So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna create a variable here, which is gonna be like saving. It's gonna create a nice little like BP lever we'll look for the BP lever variable. It's, it's trying to find a lever right here. I'm gonna hit compile. So when I press the letter E, I'm gonna get the pressing E and we can actually call this lever. I'm just gonna actually rename this to current current lever because we might have multiple lever, levers on a, on, a, on, a, on a level itself. I'm gonna bring this, I'm gonna get the current lever and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on or I'm gonna call the function activation. So when I press the letter E, what I'm gonna do is depending on what current lever I have set up, I am gonna be using um, that current lever, lever as, my, um, as my selection and it's gonna activate the lever action. Now, how are we gonna set this variable up? Because if I compile right now, you can see that we don't have any lever selected. We can actually, we can't select any lever. And the reason why we can't do this is because there's, well, there's no lever to select. Again, I'm just gonna do a very like hacky way here to, to make this to work. I'm actually gonna turn this BP lever on. So I'm gonna expose this variable and I'm gonna compile. And now um, what I'm gonna be able to do is the third person character, if I had the third person character right here, which is now the, uh, where it's that one right there, um, we, we could be able to select like which uh, master or which lever we want, but that's not, that's not what I'm gonna do here. Um, we're gonna expose the variable, I'm gonna go to the BP lever and what's gonna happen is when we begin an overlap, when, when we have this on component begin overlap, I am gonna attach this lever, like whatever lever I touch, it's gonna be attached and uh, like placed on this current lever that we have right here, okay? 
So when we touch a character, the character now is going to be like, okay, this is the closest lever that I'm interacting with. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the lever variable, set current lever as whatever lever I'm living or I'm close to right now, I'm interacting with. So I'm going to say self. I'm going to get a reference to self. And we're going to compile. So when my character approaches a lever and, and triggers it, it will know that that's the lever that's actually or currently working with. And that's the lever that's going to be activated when I press the letter E. Because again, when I press the letter E, I am going to be activating this lever right here. Now, I know that this is going to work, but I also know that this is going to cause an issue. So let me show you what's going to happen. So when I start the game and I go here and I press the letter E, boom, the lever works. When I go here, boom the lever works. And finally, when I go here, boom, the lever, lever works. But if I leave and I'm not near any lever and I press E, as you can see, it is trying to activate lever. But if I hit ask, oh, okay. In this case, nothing happened. I had an error last time when I was doing this exercise where it was trying to activate the lever even though we're not near any any lever. Because again, right now this string, let's let's place it on the, on the different side of the, of the function. Well, let's, let's place it right here. So as you can see, when I play, since we are seeing the pressing E button, that means that it is actually trying to call the function for the lever. But since there's no lever on the on the last lever that I touch, nothing's going to happen. Now that one, that one that I just uh, activated, that's the last one. And even if I try to press, nothing's going to happen, which is fine. And there we go. That's the error that we're getting. So what's what's happening here? Well, it's trying to call for a lever. But that lever no longer exists, or at least it, it won't allow me to do any sort of like a element. And then these errors are one of the things that we definitely, definitely need to fix. So I'm going to stop it right here. I actually made this error on purpose so that we can like take a look at our programming here and I can show you how to nicely uh, figure it out. So I'm going to stop the video right here. And in the next one, we're going to be doing the um, error fixing. So hang on tight and I'll see you back on the next one. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. So in this one, we're gonna troubleshoot the little lever thing that we have. And first of all, we need to understand why this is happening, right? So as you can see, we have a lot of errors right here. We got all of these elements right here. And I think I already know why this is happening. Let's give it another go. If I go into each individual lever, let's do one, two, and then three, and then I go somewhere else and I just start mashing my E letter, and I just stop the game, no errors, no problem. But if I start the game again, and I just mash my E key, and stop the game, a lot of errors. Why? Because as you remember, when we created this variable right here, this variable is currently set to none. And that's a problem because when this thing is set to none and I try to press, we're gonna get that error. And I mean, it, it won't break the game, but it's definitely something that you wanna clean up and avoid. So again, I'm gonna show you a very hacky way to do this. What I'm gonna do is here on the character, I'm gonna do an event begin play. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a node called get all actors of class. Okay. So when we do this, when we get all actors of class, I can actually select the BP lever class, the BP lever element right here. And we're going to get an array, which is just a group or a list of all of the actors in the level that uh, match this reference. In this case, that match the lever reference, which is fine, but that's not what I want to do. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go to my blueprints. I'm going to grab the lever. I'm going to duplicate. I'm going to create an instance. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to do um, create instance. Where is it? Where is it? Or yeah, let's just duplicate it. But I'm just going to call instead of calling this BP lever, I'm going to call this BP lever dummy. Okay, like this. Now, technically, let's see if this works because this lever is looking. No, actually, that's not going to work. Sorry. That works for another kind of uh, interactions, but that's not the one we're going for now. No, so no problem. So what we're going to do is we're just going to get all of the actors from the lever class. And then from this actors, I'm just going to get uh, a copy of the first uh, actor that's on the list. And that is going to be set to the current lever. So set current lever. And that's going to be set to the current lever. So if I were to hit compile and I would hit play and I would hit E, you're going to see that one of them is going to activate like that. Now, which one is it going to be? As you can see, it's this one. In this case, it's BP lever uh, 3. Now, if we have more of them, like this, and we hit play, and I hit E, it's again going to be lever 3. So for some reason, 
it, it knows that this level three is the one that's going to be activated when the game starts. And again, this is why this is a little bit of a hacky way. This is not the actual way that I would recommend doing this for a game. Uh, this is just for demonstration purposes. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this on the other side like that. So when the game starts, there's already a lever assigned to my um, to my element in this case. And I can press E as many times as I want. And as long as I haven't interacted with any other levers, the only one that's going to be getting the function or in this case is the one that's on the other side of the wall. Um, and if I hit ESC, no errors, no nothing. And I know that at any point, like again, I can activate that one, something's gonna activate somewhere, no problem. And at any point I can just go to this ones and now they are the ones that I'm activating. They're now the levers that I'm gonna be interacting with. Again, trying to keep this basic, trying to keep this simple. Uh, there's of course cleaner and more interesting or more, I, I would say more um, optimized ways to do this, but uh, let's, just, let's just keep pushing. Now, the next part is the elevator. We have this very nice elevator, which uh, we had like right about there. And now we want to connect one of these levers to the elevator, right? So technically, we don't need all of this. Let's delete them. Let's hit play and just make sure that our lever three is still the one that's uh, that's doing or, or getting all of the information. That's fine. We're just going to keep it like that. And um, now what we want to do is we want to make sure that when we press this uh, element right here, this guy over here moves down an X amount of distance because, of course, we're going to be like modifying this. So how is this going to work? Well, this is going to be a little bit different. What's going to happen here is we're going to create two more variables, of course. So we're going to create this initial position. This is going to be a um, it's going to be a transform. Actually, not a transform. Uh, it can be just a could be a vector, just a vector is fine. Vector is just three values, X, Y, and C. Uh, and we're just going to hit compile. And then we're going to uh, duplicate this. And this is going to be end position. We're also going to do an animation. So we're going to have a timeline. So let's write timeline right here. There we go. This is going to be platform platform animation and um in this case i mean we could keep this or give this a little bit more or less uh, like distance i'm gonna keep it at five just for simplicity's sake uh same stuff here i'm gonna add two points this is gonna be time zero value zero and this is gonna be time five value one i'm gonna hit compile there we go we're gonna go over here as you can see that's the new track if you want to be a little bit cleaner we can of course rename this let's call this speed there we go and we're going to create a lerp vector because we want to go from point A oh, to point B, right? So lerp vector. There we go. Now, here's where things are going to get a little bit more interesting. As you might have noticed, we did not add any sort of... Um, we did not add any sort of uh, information to these guys right here. Like, I, I don't know what the initial position is and what the final position is. I do know that I want to move this uh, two guys. So I'm going to go here to the viewport. This button, I'm actually going to bring this thing uh, back into the element. Because I do need to parent it so that we move the elevator base. So uh, here on the event graph, the thing that we're going to be moving is the elevator base. So we're going to change or set relative location. And the new location is going to be whatever happens here. So what we want here is we want this to be a little bit more flexible. We don't want to have to be guessing because maybe sometimes we'll have like a really high elevator and sometimes we're going to have like a really low elevator. And uh, we want to be able to change that on the fly depending on the level and how we want this to affect it. So the way we're going to do this is with the event begin plane. When the game begins, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the initial position Okay, so set the initial position to whatever the position of the elevator is. So I'm going to get relative location. And whatever that location is, that's going to be my initial position. So when the game starts, it's going to check where the elevator is, like literally on the world, on the level. And that's going to be the initial position. And the final position is actually going to be an X post variable. So the end position is going to be an X post variable. And I'm actually turn the, going to turn this thing called the show 3D widget on so that we can actually see where the final location is going to be. So as you can see, we have that end position locator right there. And I can grab that guy and bring it all the way down to the ground. Remember the end key that I mentioned? There we go. Whoa, actually, this one we need to manually move it. So there we go. So now, if I were to start the game, 
it would, it would know that this is the initial location, which is 730, 50, 90, 6, 6, 6, 670, sorry, and this is the final location right here. So, so we have both elements uh, working properly. Now, can we test whether or not this thing is going to advance? Of course, if we plug in the platform animation update here and we do, let's do just like a delay after the event begin play. Let's just connect this guy oh, over here. Actually, to keep this cleaner, the best way to do this is we're going to create a custom event called elevator activation. And we're going to plug this in right here. So after, let's say, five seconds, we're going to call the function called elevator activation. That's the that's like the clean way to work because everything is linear. So this allows me to jump from one line to the next. So again, the game starts, it measures or gets where this thing is set as the initial position. Um, and depending on where the end position is, that's going to be over here. And after five seconds, it's going to take five seconds to move it from the initial position to the end position. And then uh, that's just exactly what's going to happen. Okay. So now if I hit play, and I just look up, and we wait a little bit, after five seconds, that thing should be moving down. There we go. So the animation, the movement is working perfectly fine. Now we need to make sure that when we step on this button right here, we move up, right? That's the, that would be the, the ideal uh, scenario. So how is that gonna work? Well, we definitely need a collision. So I'm gonna create a collision. Let's do a box collision. This box collision is of course gonna be uh, a son of the button. So let's move this thing up, make it a little bit bigger like this. That should be more than enough. And uh, what I'm gonna do is when we hit that collision, okay, so let's say um, at the band on component begin overlap, we're gonna cast to third person character, of course, to third person character. And um, what we want to do is, again, this is just to verify that we're actually like going to the third person character. And I'm going to create another custom event that's going to be called a reverse animation. And what we're going to do is when this thing goes, we're going to go reverse from end. That's it. So we're going to just call the function reverse animation and we compile it. So technically, again, technically, everything's technically until you try it and see if it actually works. Technically, after five seconds, that elevator is going to go down thanks to the animation. And once the animation is uh, finished, we're going to be able to jump right here. And when we do this, the elevator is going to go up. Perfect, right? I mean, that looks pretty damn good. So we can, of course, add a little bit more, like, uh, I would say, um, a little bit more interest or visual interest of the whole thing. So we're going to go here to the to the uh, visual animation or to the element to the to the button. And we're actually going to create an animation for the button. So I'm going to create another timeline. So let's do time line. Let's call this button animation. And uh, what we're going to do, uh, the button is a little bit easier because we know that the button's right there and that guy's not going to move. So we only need to go from uh, this is po uh, 70 Let's do let's do seventy to, to keep like a like a whole number, and we just want this to go to like zero or whatever. Yeah, I think zero is gonna work just fine. So um, again, we're gonna use a lerp uh, vector, and in this case, I'm gonna hard code it. Hard coding means that we're not gonna use variables; everything's gonna be here. So the elevator button by default is set to zero 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 seventy, and we're gonna go to zero 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 zero. Right? That's gonna bring it down. And uh, the alpha, of course, is going to be the animation. This definitely needs to be a little bit uh, like faster. So let's call this button anim. And I think one second should be more than enough. Add key. I'm going to say even less than a second, probably like 0.25. It should be like very, very fast. Uh, time is going to be 0, 0. And then we're going to add another key. And time is going to be 0 0.25. And the value is going to be 1. Let's click this button so that we can see it. We compile, we go back to the event graph. That's going to be my plan. There we go. So what's going to happen when on component begin overlap, cast a third person character, reverse animation on the platform. And of course, before reversing the animation of the platform, I press alt and click there to get rid of the line. Before we do that, we're just going to play this animation real quick. 
when it's finished, we're going to reverse the animation. That's very important. We want to use this finish option right here. Um, otherwise, um, it, it's not going to work exactly as, as expected. Mm, actually, no. Actually, we're going to do we're going to do a delay. I'm going to explain why in just a second. Let's do the same time that it takes the button to go down. So that's 0.25 seconds. And after the button goes down, then the elevator starts moving. So we're going to get this uh, delay right here. So update 0.25 seconds. Just wait for the button to to do the, the thing. And after it um, it does it, it, it will reverse the uh, animation. Mm, I think that's going to work. Actually, thinking about this. Well, of course, we need the button. And we're going to set relative uh, location there we go let me let me just make sure that my logic is working properly so the delay does not go here actually so when this updates this is going to update the location there we go and after the location is is um updated we're going to wait 0.25 seconds and then we're going to do the reverse animation for the the, the main like a uh, lift cool now when we finish the um the uh, overlap right here we're again just gonna make sure that we're casting to the third person character make sure that we're not uh activating this when when something else goes out of the element we're gonna do the same thing but we're gonna do the again reverse from end and uh when the reverse from end just goes it's just gonna update this whole thing but here's the thing we need to create a little bit of a logic because otherwise this is going to try doing the reverse animation. It's going to do another reverse from end and it's just going to do it uh, once again. So here's where logic goes uh, or plays a very important role. We need to make sure that we know whether the lift is up or down. And usually we do this with branches, okay? I know this gets a little bit tricky, but bear with me. So I'm going to create a branch called is lift up? Question mark. I'm going to change this to a boolean i'm just gonna hit compile so when the reverse animation gets called when this function gets called i'm gonna call this variable i'm gonna get it and i'm gonna say okay is the lift up like is the, is the lift where it's supposed to be if the answer is true like yes the lift is up then i won't do anything because the lift is already up where it's supposed to start right because we're going reverse from it if it's false meaning that it's not up then we're gonna do the reverse from it okay so what's going to happen here is after we finish using the button, like we press the button, button animates, the button sets this thing to push the element up, we definitely need to set the variable to something. So what we're going to set it, well, by default, this um, by default this is going to be set to true because when the game starts, the lift is up, yes. So when the elevator activates and it goes down, this is very important, right here, we're gonna set the variable to uh, false because now the 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 elevator is no longer up, which means that the button can activate it. When we activate the button, we could go through this part right here. First of all, well, the button activates and it does all of these things. It sets the relative location, so it goes down. Perfect. Uh, it delays and then it checks. It's like, okay, do we know whether or not the lift is up? Well, if the lift is not up, which means it's down, then we're going to set the variable to now the lift is up and we're going to reverse the animation right here. Okay. If the, um, what's the word? If the, if the lift is up, like if this condition is being, uh, it, it's true, which by the way, we need to get right here. If the lid is up or moving up, which means that this is true, then we do nothing. We don't need to reverse the animation on the, um, on the on the thing anymore and when we stop this right here when we when we move out of the button we need to check whether or not again this thing is uh activated so this will reverse from end it'll just the button will just go up it will go all the way over here we'll wait a little bit and they will check hey is the lift off and since it's going to be set to uh false or sorry it's since it has been set to true then it won't do nothing it won't reverse the animation so technically Again, hopefully this is not super confusing, but we're using a little bit of a, I like to call this logic gate to check whether or not the lift should go up or not. So yeah, this seems to be working. Let's give it a shot. So, well, well before that though, uh, okay, then we can play, the lever goes down. 
and then we're just gonna start doing everything okay cool so let's play we'll wait for the animator to for the elevator sorry to go down five seconds there we go elevator goes down and now technically here's where the where the magic should begin technically when i press the button the button should go down and the elevator should go up let's see button goes down elevator is not going up so i messed something here let's fix it real quick so again when um the elevator activation was fine it's over here so when i touch when my third person character touches the uh, button overlap we did get this i'm not sure if the delay is the one that caused the uh, problem but we check the delay by the way the branch right now is set to false okay so technically the reverse animation should have activated and then the reverse activation checks okay yeah okay here's where the, where the problem is oh no no that's fine so the reverse animation checks checks that the lift is up it's set to false oh but we set it over here there we go so we keep the false we reverse the animation and then we check it's still false but after we check that this is false we set it back again to true there we go so now we reverse from nth so if this is false we set it to true it's now true it reverses from the end and when i leave the button right here when i step out of it and it checks everything again and it finds that it's true it no longer does anything so let's give it another go and let's see if our logic is working as intended this is the tricky part about programming and again i'm not a programmer uh, but hopefully you guys get an idea of how these things work so uh, lift this down we touch the button lift goes up perfect and when we step out the lift does not go does not go down again perfect so everything is behaving as expected i like how this uh, thing is is working now we need to do the final part uh, in regards to uh, programming and in regards to scripting before we jump into art again which is connect the lever to the lift so let's get to it i'll see you back on the next video of course Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of this uh, series. So now we're gonna jump onto blueprint communication, which is just the final part. As I mentioned, now that we have all of this like very basic blocks, I know that when we go into modeling, which I'm gonna do like super, super fast, um, we're gonna be able to just replace all of these things with the like cool looking objects and then we're gonna be fine, okay? So how does this work? Well, I need to find a way to tell this lever to move this specific uh, lift. Here's where we're gonna be using a little bit more of um, of variables and specific elements. So I'm gonna to go to the BP lever. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create another variable and this is gonna be an object reference again. So this is gonna be the uh, lift. I'm gonna look for for the lift, the BP lift or elevator, I think I called it. There we go. So it's gonna be looking for a BP elevator. I'm gonna call this elevator. I'm gonna hit compile. And this is gonna be an exposed variable because I definitely wanna be able to select which element I want to control, okay? Now, the cool thing about this is once we set up the elevator, it's very easy to activate it because we can just grab this, get elevator, and we can just say, hey, you know what? Um, we're gonna do a, um, I think I call this activation. Yeah, elevator activation. So all of these things, of course, are gonna go down here. And if you guys remember, on the lever activation, this is where we're gonna be doing. So after, or I, actually, I think at the same moment we activate this before any animation or anything, this is where I want to activate this guy right here. Okay, so when we do the lever activation, which if you guys remember is being done by the character itself, when we do the lever activation, this will activate whatever elevator we're uh, like targeting. And once we target that elevator, then everything's going to be fine. Um, I'm going to compile. And uh, I'm going to select this guy. As you can see, it's got this little like eye picker. We can select this one. So now this lever is connecting to, is connected to this elevator. And if I hit play, technically, I should be able to go here, press the letter E, and ta-da! The elevator is going down. We leave the lever. We move right here. Touch the button. Everything is working smoothly. And we just keep going. Continue our journey here on the game. So there we go. That's the that's the way to do it. Now I do uh, suspect there's going to be a little bit of an issue. If I were to hit play and I were to uh, hit E on an, on an element that has no uh, particular uh, elevator, 
Uh, in this case, it's actually, that's very weird. It's actually activating that one right there, which shouldn't do it. And of course we're getting all of these errors because I'm activating things that shouldn't be activated. So let me just double check that there's no like a bank begin play or something. That's really, really weird. Let me try to replicate that error again. So, okay, so since we started the game right here, I think we're activating this. So let's push this back. There we go. So if we go here, technically, this shouldn't activate. There we go. So yeah. Oh, it is activating. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's not. A, I, I think it's because of. Uh, it should be like a delay or something. Yeah, we had the the five second delay. Remember this one? Let's just get rid of it. That's my bad. Now, how do we fix the fact that since we this one doesn't have an elevator, like like what should we do, right? Usually, usually you're not gonna have that. Like usually, if you have a lever, there's gonna be an elevator that works with that lever. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, but if uh, you get that, we could do another like this one. We can just create like a dummy elevator and use that one to to like plug anything that we're not using at that point. But let me show you real quick how this can become very modular and very very cool. So let's create another elevator right here. I'm going to add another elevator. And since we were able to do this, all of these things with blueprints, this is the amazing thing about blueprints. We don't have to think about how to properly calibrate any of these things because all of these guys will work exactly as we expect them to work. So for instance, we can add another lever here. And then this lever, I'm just going to little eyedropper this one and select that one so that it knows that that one goes to elevator two. And if I hit play and I go here, hit E, this guy will activate this elevator. And I just go there. You can increase the speed, of course, on the on the blueprint itself. And we go over here. We hit E. And now this other elevator is coming down without affecting the, the previous one. So as you can imagine, like we can build a whole world with all of these blueprints because they're going to be very flexible and they're completely ready to just like move our character to wherever we need. Some of you might be wondering, well, is there a way to change the blueprints so that uh, when we are up here, the lever goes back to zero? Because right now, if I were to fall down and activate this thing, nothing will happen. Well, the, the thing is happening here, but the, <laughs> the, the little like rod, the animation is not going back, right? So is there a way to fix that? Yeah, probably the easiest one would be after uh, we've done this lever activation, we can just do again another custom event. Oh, let's create another custom event. Let's call this rest reset lever. This is going to be, of course, a reverse from end. And when this is finished, we can add a, or actually, no, again, uh, we don't want to do this because if we do this, it's going to loop and we don't want to do that loop. So what we can do then, let me think, let me think. Okay, so I know that this thing takes two seconds to, or, or was it two seconds? Yeah, two seconds to activate. So probably the, the easiest way to do this would be after the set relative location, I'm going to add a delay of like four seconds. Or four seconds. And after this is done, I'm just going to do lever reset. Or reset lever. So what's going to happen is this thing's going to activate, it's going to do its animation, and four seconds later, uh, two after the animation is done, it will just reset back uh, to, to, the, to the beginning, which you're probably going to be riding the elevator when this happens. So again, let's give it a shot. So we do that. One, two, three, there we go. The, reset, uh, the, the lever resets, and then we go here. Now, of course, there's... Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's looping back. That's weird. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we will need to do another, like, logic gate, similar to what we did with the elevator to check is the lever up, is the lever down, blah, 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 blah. In this case, I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm just going to, I'm just gonna, not going to do it. <laughs> so we're not going to do any lever uh, reset. Um, what other thing could we do? I'm trying to think if there's another way to, to make this simple. Because mm. we can definitely do when this is finished. We just reverse from end, but what's going to happen is after it ends, or maybe that will work. Let's give it a shot. Reverse from end. Now it's going to reset. It's just going to it's just going to loop together. So now I'm just going to I'm just going to leave it like this, guys. I, I don't want to drag this too much, and I definitely want to do the the nice like uh, 3D part of it so when we where we actually see all of these things like uh, decorated in a very nice way. So uh, I'm going to stop this one right here, guys. We're pretty much done with our blueprint communication. Again, this is just a basic overview of how Unreal works, but hopefully with all of this, you guys uh, understand how flexible this system can be. Now, by the way, let me, let me do one more thing here. The elevator, since we set the translation of the elevator, 
elevator to a vector uh, translation, we can actually move this thing in the in vertical ways. So for instance, we can start right there or we can end right there. Well, let's, let's do it the opposite side. Let's let's start down here. Like, I don't know. In this like wall or something. And then we grab the little crystal point. And we can move it up here. Of course, we'll need another lever. And that lever is going to be uh, the calling that one right there. And now we give the shot. Again, we just press E. This one comes down. There's, of course, ways to control when we can press the button, if we can only press it when it's down, if we can press it uh, if we have a key. Like, uh, you you guys uh, are probably super, super smart, and you know that we can, like, increase or, or make this thing as complex as we want. I'm just showing you the very basic uh, things right now. For instance, I haven't checked that bug, but there probably would be a bug if I, like, uh, try to step uh, several times on the button. Like if I do this, oh, I fell. <laughs> anyway, there's probably like a couple of bugs and, and troubleshooting that we would need to do, but hopefully with all of this uh, information, guys, you get a, a better idea of how this works. And you can actually incorporate all of these things, like opening doors, um, again, platforms, lights turning on and off. Like there's a lot of things that you can add to like a nice little interactive scene here inside of Unreal, and it's gonna bring your projects to a very, very nice level. So this is it for this one, guys. In the next couple of videos, we're gonna take a look at how to quickly prepare this element for, um, what's the word? for the actual uh, like a modeling part of it. So hang on tight and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye bye. Hi guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. So today we're gonna take a look at the modeling part of things. And the, if you remember, this were the base meshes that we had before. And I'm just gonna be using this ones to, to create something you know, a little bit nicer. So let's start with this one, for instance. Uh, easiest thing to do, let's just hit a bevel. Give this a bevel, small little fraction. So this is like a, like a nice wooden board. I'm gonna grab this guy right here and this guy right here. Control E to scale them down. So I'm just gonna offset this a little bit to create like a like a border here for our, our main like area. Control E again, let's push this uh, down again. And uh, probably just gonna bevel like this one and this one. So just give it a nice quick bevel there. And that's it. Now, if I want this to be even like like tighter or nicer, we can of course add like more bevels to other pieces, but I think this is, this is gonna be like perfectly fine. And if we uh, play with uh, textures in a nice way, we are gonna be able to create a very nice like wood texture. Now, um, as you can see here, it doesn't fit perfectly. So I'm just gonna scale this down. I know that we've already exported these things, but we can always re-export things to make them look a little bit better. And let's jump onto this one right here. So for this one, I'm definitely gonna delete the lower parts. We don't need them. I am gonna mirror or bridge these two guys right here. So that it's a complete shape. Complete shape. And I do wanna have the sort of uh, like a group on the, on the inside where this lever is gonna be like a rotating from. So we know from Unreal that this guy is gonna have its pivot point on the origin, right? Because Unreal resets everything to zero. So we're gonna grab this one. And uh, I know that minus 70 is gonna be the, the limits. It's about there. That's perfect. That's roughly where this thing ends. So I'm gonna grab my cut tool. I'm gonna cut the line right in the middle. And I'm gonna do like 60% uh, and 40%. There we go. And I'm gonna grab one, two, three, four, five, six. So an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Control E, push this thing in. A little bit more, so something like that. And that, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm just gonna grab all of the borders here. And I wanna make this sort of like fantasy medieval looking. You guys know I, I love that sort of stuff. Let's change the military to uniform so that we don't have any uh, angons. There we go. That looks that looks very nice. And uh, let's like add some sort of like reinforcement to this to this thing right here. And make sure to grab all of the edge loops. So I'm gonna bevel this. Grab those guys and this guys. I'm gonna Control E. Give them a little bit of an extrusion. Grab this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Bevel this. Fraction. So it's like a like a metal thing thing. And then uh, for the panels here, like on the outside, I think we would benefit from having those, but just like again, keep it simple. 
So I'm just going to grab a cube here. And use this as a, as a bracket. You guys have seen bikes, right? So you have the bikes have this sort of like a armor or not armor, the uh, spokes. I think, I think that's the proper, the proper name for this things like spokes. So something like this, of course, bevel this. I love bevels. They add so much like interest or visual interest to things. Control D. Let's rotate this. Uh, actually, I don't think we need to rotate it. Can we bend it from it? I'm not sure. I'm just gonna add like a like a horizontal one going across. This is just like a like a reinforcement piece or something. Let's make this one a little bit thinner. Try to match it with. Like, I don't know, something like this. This one actually, let's push it in. Because I do want to have overlap, but a little bit closer to that side. Again, I, I'm just being a little bit more like a... <laughs> I'm not being super careful with this one because we've already spent too much time on the on the other parts of things. All of these guys, we're just going to mirror to the x-axis on the world. Actually, it's to the positive axis on world. And there we go. That looks a little bit better. Of course, again, textures are should give us a, a nice little uh, effect here. And uh, for the handle, this one I definitely want to like modify it a little bit more. So let's go zero. Let's add like a nice little element right there. Control E, offset this a little bit of thickness, so it's a little bit uh, thicker on the on the base. Let's push this one down. I'm gonna bevel this one. Let's give it round. Let's give it another like bevel there. Maybe a little bit thicker. Does that work? It's a little bit too thick, I think. Okay, that works. Um, yeah, so now it's just a matter of uh, converting this into uh, or, or doing the, the UVs real quick. So I'm gonna grab everything. I'm just gonna use my, my traditional UV method. So let's isolate this one. I'm gonna say um, modeling UV, UV editor. And uh, some of them already have some UVs, but I'm just gonna delete everything. So delete UVs. There we go. Let's start with this one. This one's super easy. Uh, so I'm gonna say UV camera base just to get something. And then for the cuts, we're gonna go UV. 3D cut, cut right there. Cut right there, cut right there, and cut across, and cut across, like that. And we control U to unfold, and that's it. That's the, that's the first piece, easy PC. Let's go with this one. Uh, fairly easy as well. Actually, easiest way for this one is just go to the front view or side view. Just grab all of the faces like that and say UV planar from the y-axis there we go and then we grab everything else and uh, we do another uv like just camera planar like that and then to make this thing unfold a little bit nicer uh, we can cut the this line right here and of course this line right here so uv cut uv edges and technically if we unfold this control u there we go. That looks nice. Oop. So that PC is done. And then we have uh, this guys right here and this box right here. To be honest, this one's automatic mapping. So I'm just going to do automatic. I'm just going to do like straight lines everywhere. And then we take a look at the UV editor. It's just a matter of control U again. Uh, make sure, I think I did forgot to do this. Make sure to freeze the transformations and everything. So that when you unfold, the size of the islands and everything look the proper way and then we're just going to press ctrl l to lay everything out and as you can see we have a very nice um ub map for for pretty much all of the pieces so yeah that's uh th that's it now for the um, uh, for the base right here this one um we don't have the exact measurements i mean we do if we go here and we go to the elevator base you guys remember it's 3, 3 and 0.15. So technically, if we want to make sure that they're like perfectly fine, we would create this one. It's three meters, so it's 300, 300, or actually, 
0.15 and 300 over here. There we go. Or 15 actually. There we go. So that's the that should be the size of the of the elevator. Let me just double check. Yep. And the button is uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 1.45. But it's going to be uh, the the button's a little bit different because it's uh, it's scaled based on on this one right here. So I'm actually just going to do one for this one, and the, and then the button is just going to be a duplicate of this one. It's just going to be smaller. So that way I'm going to do this as uh, very similar to how we did the other one or the other parts. I'm just going to offset this thing to create like a like a metal border. Control E, just push this down a little bit. Actually, another way to do this: grab this guys, edit mesh, or mesh. Uh, yeah, edit mesh and just uh, extract. So now, as you can see, this guy right here is just a frame. So grab this one, is this one, uh, bridge, uh, bridge. Grab everything, bevel. There we go. Again, I'm just gonna. I, I know we can spend like a lot of time, like creating a very nice model of this guys, but since uh, time is of the essence, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a little bit briefer than usual. We're gonna bridge this. There we go. And this one, I'm gonna show you a quite nice little trick here. I'm gonna go into Mesh Tools, Multiple Edge Loops. Right here, Insert Edge Loop, Multiple Edge Loops. Let's say six. Seems like a nice number. There we go. And I'm gonna grab all of these guys. I guess, uh, faster way. Let's just <laughs> delete all of them. Grab this guy, this guy, and just bridge. Uh, bevel. And then what I can do? Set to the pivot point. Control D. Get it really close. Even if there's a little bit of overlap. And then just shift D, shift D, shift D, shift D. Uh, this one, let's make it a little bit bigger. That's fine. That's it. Like this one, like we can add a little bit of like variation, like change how the planks are like uh, moving just a little bit, you know. Or we can just make them like slightly, slightly thinner. That makes a like an interesting uh, piece of uh, furniture. So grab all of these guys and this guy as well. Let's combine them into a single object. Same existing material is just a Lambert. And since it's very square, we can just do an automatic mapping and it should work just fine. So UB, UB editor. Yeah, it's just a control U, control L. Uh, it's a little bit of wasted space, but I, again, just for, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it like this. So this is it guys. I am just gonna grab uh, both objects actually. Well, let's, uh, the lever, one thing about the lever, if you guys remember all of these guys and this guy should be combined into a single object. Uh, that's the lever base. That's the lever handle, and this was this one was called lever. What was the proper name here? Lever mechanism. Now here's one of the fun parts for this one. Uh, let's of course let's actually delete this one right here. Oh. The history. There we go. So lever mechanism. There we go. So if we grab the lever pieces and say file export selection, and we export it in the lever again, we can actually go uh, here to Unreal, select all of these three guys, right click, and just hit reimport, and it's gonna check or it's gonna see that the elements have been updated, and it doesn't matter where things were on your level, things will be updated as well. Super super handy. Uh, and then this one, of course, we're just gonna say file export selection. It's gonna be the uh, elevator. Cool. So I'm going to stop the video right here, guys. And in the next one, we're going to throw in some quick textures instead of substance. And then we'll assemble everything in Unreal and we'll be ready to go. So hang on tight and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye. Hey guys, welcome back to the next part of our series. Today we're going to continue with the texturing of the whole things. And again, in a very similar fashion to how we did the modeling, I'm going to do this very, very fast because it's um, um, it's uh, we're, we're really close to the, to the time that we're assigning to this whole thing. So yeah, I'm just going to run real quick here to the assets folder of our mini premium course. And let's start with the lever. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to do a 2K. We don't need 4K. I'm just going to hit OK. This is the object right here. We're gonna go to our uh, texture set settings, bake mesh maps, and even though we don't have any high poly, I'm just gonna bake to have like ambient occlusion and stuff. 
And I'm gonna be using smart materials and presets just again to get a nice clean uh, thing looking here. I'm gonna go into the layers and if we go into the smart materials here, uh, there's one that I really like, which is like an old wood, like a chest wood or something. Uh, this one, wood chest stylized. I'm just gonna add it right here. Look at that. Just by adding that, it already looks pretty, pretty cool. I'm just gonna right click and add a black mask. And with my uh, number four, I'm gonna go into my um, uh, UV selection mode and we're gonna select some of the UVs right here. So like those ones right there, this one right here. That seems to be like a double mesh over there. That's weird. And uh, of course, like this one's, oh, this one's right here, like on the bottom part. Yeah, that looks good. Now we're gonna add a metal, and I really like there's again like in this iron old metal that we have right here. I'm just gonna add black mask, and again we're gonna just like in this case I am gonna go with fill mesh, like this, and let's do it like over here, and then we're gonna go to uh, quad mode. Let's turn on symmetry because I don't want to do this twice. And we're just gonna start like painting some of these elements again i know we can be like way way cleaner with this um but i wanted this course this class to be more focused on unreal that's where we're not focusing if you guys want to check this out remember we uh released the majora's mask texturing process um a couple of weeks ago you might want that one you might want to check that one also check out the the rigging course that we did uh, not so long ago that's also free for you guys and um rigging is really really important I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys can get a lot of uh, mileage out of that one as well. There we go. Perfect. That looks that looks interesting. Again, not perfect, but you know, <laughs> we get some nice details. Another thing we can do here, for instance, is we can grab and just add like a, like small, a small little rivets here and there. You know, just to add a little bit more complexity to the whole piece take as much time as you want on the on this uh, like section and you can get like a really nice result as well but i really like how this one looks i'm just gonna use like some sort of like a like this plastic or, or like metal thingy over here i'm gonna say black mask and we're gonna use this one for the top part and there we go just to you know have a little bit more of a of an easier easier time so now i'm just going to say file export textures and we're going to export this i usually like to export things in the same place here so on the ui5 assets it's going to be the folder and we're going to export this is very important we're going to export this as the Unreal Engine for uh, Pact, which is gonna save some space. So this one right here. Uh, they should update this to Unreal Engine 5, but it's the same element, so it shouldn't be that much of a, of a difference. There we go. Uh, let's just open the di directory to make sure that, yeah, we got the, the elements that we need, perfect. Now I'm gonna say File, uh, New, uh, Select, and we're gonna do the Elevator, okay. Of course, save this. So this is gonna be the lever textures there we go save and the elevator we're also going to do something very similar so we're just going to bake mesh maps 2k oh, yeah, 2k bake just to get ambient occlusion and stuff go to the layers let's set this wood chest stylized so they match black mask this guy's only we add the uh, iron old Black mask. That's the UV. And that's it. Now this one I think we can benefit from a little bit of rust. So I'm gonna add just like a rust layer here. Black mask. Add a generator. And we're gonna add a dirt generator. And I like to change this to like an overlay. So we get a little bit more texture. That's it. So file. Export textures. Again, you can make these things as complicated or as simple as you guys want. Uh, feel free to, to play around with that stuff. And we're just gonna export this as Unreal Engine 4 packed as well. And we're gonna hit export. 
There we go. So we check the directory. We have all of these elements. So we grab all of these guys, of course. And we're going to drag and drop them into Unreal. Right here. We also, of course, need to import our um, elevator. So let's go for the elevator. There we go. Import. And here's the fun part. Um, since we want to replace this elevator right here, we can just go to the blueprints. We can go to the elevator base. And here we're using this uh, cube. We can just change this and look for the elevator. And uh, of course, we're going to need to adjust it a little bit. It's fine. Something like that. I think it works. And then we're going to go to the button. And the button, we're also going to change it to the elevator. Here's where things might be a little bit different. This box, of course, we need to change the proportions. We might need to change a little bit of the values and stuff, but it shouldn't be that much. Compile, there we go. Now, this Lambert 1, I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this M Elevator because that's the one that's assigned to the elevator right now. Uh, let's go to the elevator. Remember that the texture is here. We need to get rid of that one and just save. And we're going to go here. Grab this three guys. I say remember because I did this uh, last week for or, or in the last videos for the mask as well, I think. So this is how we work with textures. This is the color, of course. This is a normal. R is the ambient occlusion. G is the roughness. And B is the metallic. Very important. We just hit save. And in just a second, you guys are going to see now how... Uh, wait, did I not compile this? Okay, here on the on the elevator base, we can just drag and drop the elevator material. There we go. And on the button also. And as you can see, we get this. Look at that. Really pretty. And finally, for this one, we definitely need a new material. So right-click material, and we're going to call this M a lever. Go right here. Same process. This one right here, we need to get rid of it, of the sRGB. Save. And here on the lever, we grab these three images, bring them in. This is the color material, goes into base color. Red goes into ambient occlusion. Green goes into roughness. And blue goes into metallic. And this one goes into normal. There we go. And then now it's just a matter of going into the actual BP lever here. Grab the, it, it can be here or we can actually go to this option right here. Doesn't really matter. And then on here on the materials, we just uh, plug the materials in. We compile and voila. So now we hit play. And as you can see, we have this very nice materials here and all of our functionality is working as expected. So yeah, that's it, guys. Thank you very much for the um, for your time. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this very nice class. I know that we we rushed a little bit here, here and there, but I, I want to make sure that it's as, as efficient and as practical as possible for you guys to follow. Make sure to uh, to uh, like, share, subscribe, and, and follow us uh, everywhere that we upload our stuff. And uh, th that's it. Thank you very much, guys. Let us know in the comments what you think, and I'll see you back for the next one. Bye bye.